Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today to support the artists in photography now. My name is Tamora Wright. I'm an independent curator and currently managing the gallery program here at BlackRock until they find a wonderful gallery director. I'm decided <laughs> to have the opportunity to be here to present photography now and our guest, Jerb Mavesh Lilich. Mavesh Lilich is an Istanbul-born artist, curator, and educator based in Maryland. She holds a BA from the University of Chicago and an MFA from Bard College and currently serves as curator at the Academy of Art Museum. She has been awarded the National Geographic Ex Expeditions Council Grant and Faith Flanagan Fellowship the Association of Art Museum Curators Conference Fellowship, and the City of Chicago Individual Artist Award. Her work has been exhibited and published widely. Mevesh will talk about the work and give her perspective on what she was looking for and what was successful in the show. But first, I want to say how beautiful the show is and congratulate the artists. And if you are an artist, raise your hand so we can all clap for you. Beautiful work. Thank you. So initially our conversation for photography now is to present abstract photo photography to highlight diverse approaches and subject matter. I was blown away to see and understand the extent of what that means. I'm going to speak for myself as a curator, um, absorbing photography and separating the visual arts from everyday life and imagery is hard. But the abstract approach successfully showcases photography as it illustrates our sense of wonder and distortion. It really pushes us to understand the world around us in a different way. I was blown away to see new technologies used, mixed media, and many styles of abstraction. So I'm going to hand it over to Mavesh. Um, and we're going to um, talk about what you were interested in highlighting in the mm -hmm. show. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tamora. Congratulations to all the artists. I really loved spending time with your work on a screen and now in person. Uh, all the prints look absolutely amazing. Congratulations. Thank you, Tamora, for laying them out and installing them so beautifully. I think um, it's... Hey, <laughs> Shout out to you guys. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. And, you know, it's an honor to be here. It's such, it seems like such a special, intimate art space here. And I'm really blown away both by the beauty of the building and how many people turned out on a Sunday afternoon to celebrate beautiful photographs. I think about abstract photography all the time because I feel like we've come a long way since Aaron Siskin got kicked out of New York Photo League for making abstract photographs. I don't know if you know the story, but, you know, he was part of this league that uh, was interested in documentary photography and for, for the betterment of the living conditions of the people in New York. And because he was starting to photograph wall cracks that you know, were very expressionistic, he got kicked out. And so I'm, I'm glad that today we can actually celebrate abstract photography here instead of uh, you know, demeaning it in, in that way. Uh, and I was really interested in two uh, distinct camps of making abstract work. One is kind of finding things that look abstract and placing them in front of the camera. I think this is really important because medium is the message, right? Like the medium we use to make any artwork is essentially plugging into what we want that work to mean. Um, and so uh, choosing to use photography is really inseparable from the moment that we're living in now. Photography is so ubiquitous. It's all in our pockets. And in a way, it feels like um, you know an act of uh, defiance to make a photograph that's not necessarily showing something very realistically in you know insane detail um, and sharpness. So I, I really love the effort and uh, the creativity that goes into that. And then um, the, the second camp, the in the way that I interpret it was showing things or you know, making photographs and, and depicting things in only the way that photography can depict these things. Uh, Joe Williams's work is a good example, actually. Um, if you want to turn around, it's that, that little splash, uh, the red splash, the, the bottom left work on this wall. Um, you know, because photography can, uh, you know, freeze the moment in a way that our eye can't really understand or see, we get exposed to almost, you know, the scientific details of, of, of how things behave, like droplets of water. And in that way, it almost becomes abstract because we're not used to really detecting what happens to a droplet of water when it hits the surface of a, of a body of water. Um, so I was kind of thinking about these these two types of work, and I was really blown away by like the absolute range of, of what I was looking at. 
um, and I think I'm I'm sorry if I don't shout out to you specifically, but all the work um, you know is is really beautiful. But I I do want to speak about some particular works that really resonated with me. Um, I really loved seeing Julian Abir McMaster's work. Uh, there's a little tomato behind you. That's a cyanotype. Um, and again, this is about putting things in front of the camera and then depicting them in an abstract way, where you know the, there is a separation between uh, what is being photographed and how real it looks. And cyanotype is one of those processes that because it's a contact print, um, or maybe you use a negative. Did you use a negative? It's a, it's a tomato. <laughs> wow. Great. <laughs> um, and because it's a contact print, sometimes you don't really know what the, the exact result is going to be once you kind of fix what, what you're making. Uh, and in that way, putting a moist slice of tomato on an already uh, you know, a chemistry that's very, very volatile is, I think, in many ways, a very nice accomplishment. Uh, I also really enjoyed s seeing Jillian's other work um, right there that has a little bit of motion blur. And this is what I was talking about when I when I said, you know, uh, the camera can depict things only in a way that only the camera can. Um, and I think that photographs like this has even influenced what painters are making right now, uh, just because you know we weren't really used to seeing these things prior to the advancement or the invention even of, of photography. So that's I think really really important. Um, and then there's also using photography to introduce mystery to the process. I think that Maria Barbosa's pictures are like the perfect example. To me, these really resonate with the age of COVID because I think they're all from uh, you know it's it's called beyond the bedroom curtain. So there's this understanding that the, the viewer is standing inside a bedroom and looking out. And we can kind of see these long exposure kind of light um, you know, motifs that are really, really interesting. But if you look closely, it almost looks like an engraving because the background is, um, you know, kind of, you know, striped uh, or a scan. So I really enjoy how photography, instead of creating more exactness, is introducing mystery and confusion to the process. I, I love that. It's my favorite thing. Um, and then also, Bridget Sullivan's work similarly um, it does a you know, has a similar effect where right in the middle of the picture, you see something that's very expository, that's very indexical to what she's photographing, which is nature. But then she uses, you know, painting and, and I think pastels and, and, um, and uh, crayons, not crayons, pastels and, uh, and painting, yes, graphite, um, in order to, you know, create a little bit of nebulousness around the edges, and I, I really, really like that. And then there's, of course, putting things in front of the camera that look very abstract. I really enjoy seeing Mark Cox's work, which are right here. They actually really work as a diptych for me. And this really made me think about the eye of the camera, right? So we see things in a certain way, and the camera sees them differently. And that's where all of the magic happens. There's this great book that I love by Charlotte Cotton called Photography's Magic. If you can get your hands on it, I really, really recommend it. And it's basically a selection of photographs that make you think that the camera can really do magical things. Uh, I really enjoyed looking at all the work. Congratulations again. Um, and thank you, Tamora. And thank, thank you, Black you. Rock, for giving me this opportunity. Yes, thank you. OK, so I do want to talk about some of the works that look like paintings, because for me, that was very su surprising to look through all of the work. And I'm like, how is this photography? And then going back to the new technologies, um, were, were these exposures and the different technologies that they're use, using something that you are used to seeing? Or how is that experience for you? Yeah, I mean, there's always this element of surprise, right? I, I wasn't there when um, the artist was making this work. I think Richard Weiblinger's work is a good example. Um, and, and so I can't be sure exactly how uh, the artist is using the camera. I, I have an educated guess, but I think the beautiful thing about photography is because the technology behaves so differently in different instances and with different materials, um, and especially when uh, you know these physical interventions with paint are involved, um, I, I think that's that's really fun. And I think in in many ways they do. I, I talked about Aaron Siskind a bit, and I really love his work. Obviously, he's so important for photography, like the history of photography. Uh, but you know, you you see the 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 influence of that even today with all of the digital advancements that we have, just because almost always these abstractions originate in the way that we see the world and how we want to change 
that way that we see the world into something that's a little bit more um, expressive, a little bit more um, poetic almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk about movement in this show and like maybe some of the pieces, on, like specifically like this one and how you know it's capturing something that that we know moves, but like I think movement and time together um, come out in this show as a theme. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I loved all the different instances of motion blur across uh, the different works and how each artist used it very, um, you know, individually, you know. Um, I think that for the Cam Miller work is really interesting to me because it does straddle that point where what you're looking at just starts becoming unrecognizable just because it's blurry. Uh, but then again, also um, having long exposure lights uh, such as the, the middle piece on that wall that's black and white, uh, that is a light painting uh, pretty much, where the movement of light because of the long exposure takes on its own form. Um, and in many ways, it's like working with a brush. You know, if you had paint on that brush, you would kind of, um, it, it, the, the work would result in a similar kind of aesthetic um, character. Um, and I'm also really interested in how much, um, you know, carnivals and amusement parks made it into this show, mm -hmm. uh, just because it's just, it's, you know, it's such a, such a fruitful way of looking at how light behaves. And, um, you know, again, when you set your camera up for a long exposure, you have a good idea of what the, the long exposure and the light painting will look like, but you don't have an exact idea until you make the image. And I think that's really, really interesting. That's, you know, that adds a lot of fun to the process, probably. It does. Um, I'm trying to frame, figure out how to frame this question. Um, I think that a lot of these pieces go into the micro. Um, like even this piece, it's like you have to kind of like go in and see like all of these details and then all of the pieces over there, you have these like very fine like moments and it's a very visceral experience being able to get up close and see like these like hairs, these fine, you know, so can you talk a little about, about that or what was your experience looking at these works? Absolutely. I mean, I looked at all of these w works on a computer screen, which, uh, the, I mean, they all looked beautiful, but the prints are really gorgeous, and this really does all of the work justice. I do love the kind of the idea of moving really close to them without losing quality or the images getting pixelated, so which, which is, you know, definitely a treat. Um, you know, David Hockney once said, uh, photography is interesting only if you're interested in seeing the world through kind of the point of view of a paralyzed cyclops. Um, and <laughs> he... <laughs> We know how he really thinks. Um, but I think that it's, it's really interesting because I think that's actually an asset to, to just have this one eye that you can bring as close as you want to a particular subject matter. And because of the advancements of how we make and edit pictures right now, to be able to blow up certain parts of an image um, in a meaningful way. Um, so in that way, it did show me a lot of details in the images that I would never like think compelling or or even existed as kind of an aesthetically valuable um, you know detail I think the disco ball is a, is a great example um, I don't think I've met you Diana Helen Jarvis I don't know if you're here are you here oh hi um, I I mean this is really interesting to me because usually disco balls are suspended in the ceiling of like kind of a high school gym for you know a dance right or or at a, at a club. So it's, it's really interesting to be able to look into a disco ball out in the world during daytime. Uh, and so again, the, the, a photograph of it can bring that particular likeness in this gallery so that I can see it and I can think, oh, this is a really interesting way of closing in on something that's just a vernacular object that is used in completely different contexts. So yeah, I do, I do think there's a lot of beautiful zooming and a lot of beautiful detail. I'm going to give everyone the opportunity to ask Nevesh a question, or if you have a question about the show, um, we can. No? No questions? <laughs> um, are, you are a photographer, correct? How does your own practice, how did your own practice inform the work that you chose for the show? I think that's a great question. I think that all jurors, like it's, it's really hard to, we all have biases and, you know, likes and 
um, interest in photography, and it so happened that actually abstract photography, like I, I'm, I'm really interested in how it's been used historically and how it's being used now. A lot of my work is much more um, expository in nature. It's it's about finding subjects and putting them in front of the camera. So this was definitely a great diversion from my practice in that way. Um, I do make a lot of contact prints, so I think that uh, that definitely played a role in it. Um, but I think that uh, you know, as a in the gamut of the things that we all do as artists, which is not only making work but interpreting it for other people, um, and also you know, existing in this this weird um, capacity in life where you know your labor is always almost always kind of um, ignored. Uh, it w it was really special for me to see all of this work and think about all the work that went into it. So I think in in that way, being an artist really influenced influences the way I c I recognize what people make and how they make it. Um, and yeah, it's, it was amazing to see an absolutely mind-blowing variety of abstract photographs, um, you know. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so for me, like I mentioned, I see visual imagery all day looking at Instagram, just like things online, right? So seeing abstract photography is so important and I want to also know if you have a similar experience um, or interest in abstract photography because of, you know, I feel like there's such a difference between like taking a regular photo or a portrait and then seeing the distortions and the things that you can do with a photograph. Um, so I don't know if that was a question or... <laughs> No, I think it comes down to intention, right? So what is the artist intending to make and how are they making it? Um, I think that's really important even when you're looking at people's work on Instagram, whether that is kind of a, a selfie that your friend uploaded or you know something that an artist actually made. Um, so I think in that way, it's... It's important to recognize that making photographs and manipulating photographs is now easier than ever. Uh, but at the same time, it does introduce a layer of intentionality where because it's so easy, everything you do as an artist needs to have you know, a good either you know, intentional or intuitive basis. I don't know if that that makes sense, but um, yeah, I mean, and you know, if you think about Instagram, if you upload a, a fine art, I don't really believe in that you know, in the dichotomy, but a fine art image that you made in an abstract manner, then the algorithm will not really like that because it does want your face. Um, and so, you know, thinking it in conjunction with our digital culture right now and how we as a community of artists come together and look at each, other wor each other's work is really, I think, important and fascinating and kind of frustrating sometimes. So much to look at. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why the show is very refreshing to me because it's all so different, things that I haven't, like you said, you wouldn't see unless you captured this like droplet, you mm -hmm. know, so it's a very special show and I want to congratulate you all. Yeah, congratulations so everyone. For supporting the artists. Um, those are all the questions that I have. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Mavesh, for you, all your Beautiful show. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone.